Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Hayes. It's October 14th, Friday of a week in which Putin has launched so many missiles. I'm calling it Putin's Missile Week. And based on the lack of results, it might also be known as Missile Fail 2022. So this week, as you're probably aware, Russia has launched waves of missiles. Start on a Monday, a lot of, you know, over 100, like 112 missiles being launched at infrastructure in Ukraine, basically targeting energy infrastructure as far back, you know, getting reaching almost to Kiev, right? So going into the rear areas, hitting a lot of civilian targets, killing a bunch of folks, disrupting power. Throughout the week, after that initial wave, there have been more, like there were 33 missiles the next day. And then they've been, you know, we've had successive attacks, but they seem to be getting smaller. One key thing, though, is they're not attacking anything critical to the fighting. They are attacking what might be considered strategic targets in the rear, but they are not doing anything that can really stop the Ukrainian offensive. The key thing, though, I say is that the target audiences, it's not the target, it's the target audience. The Russian nationalists and mill bloggers that were outraged, you know, and started directly criticizing Putin as a result of the attack on the Kerch Strait Bridge. And, you know, that is, I think, we have to understand that, that Putin is probably now playing mainly to a domestic audience. But sticking with the missile attacks themselves, right? we had a decreasing volume of attacks, so they, they didn't keep up the shock and awe. It was, you know, on Monday it looked bad, and the, the reports, oh, a brutal new turn in the war, and is this Putin's new strategy, and yada, yada, yada. And then it kind of dribbled off, right? 33 shots the next day and all. And then people started noticing, hey, they're really using kind of either low tech, they're using Iranian drones that, you know, there's a lot of talk about those drones. They are not precise. They are not good. And, you know, they they appear to be just totally useless to attack troops. So yeah, let's attack apartment complexes. Uh, They're probably aimed at something different. They they said a lot of these attacks, it's not even clear what they're aiming at, right? Um, Also, the Russians are substituting weapons. They are, no, they are not using precision ground attack or even ground attack weapons. They're using air defense weapons in a ground attack mode. And increasingly, they're using caliber cruise missiles, which are anti-ship missiles. Presumably, they have a lot of them. And so they're substituting in other weapons that are less precise, less suited to the task. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians' defenses are bad. 50-ish percent, right? The Ukrainians say, hey, look, we have 10% of the equipment we need, uh, which may be right, uh, but they're, they look like they're knocking down about half of these things as they come in. And uh, so they need more equipment. But, you know, one thing I look at this, I say, look, one is there's a morale effect of even if you aren't getting 100% being able to report that you are, you know, I, I think 50% is a, a decent starting point to work with them. Obviously, it needs to be improved. The other thing is to always keep in mind that there's shooting down the missiles and there's repairing what they hit. That damage control and the ability to put your infrastructure back into action is critical. And they did that. You know, they were able to fairly quickly turn things around. And so that is as much and a part of this, I think, as the uh, anti, uh, as the air defense, right? And I think that's something that, you know, they can be helped out with, right? That's something I, I hope someone's uh, paying attention to that. But all right, so that's the kind of tactical aspect of this. Now, strategically, right, the world reaction was massive condemnation, right? Just, I mean, everything came out. Uh, you know, uh, world leaders just one after another condemning it, you know, reacting to the missile attacks. And uh, on Wednesday, the UN was voting on whether to uh, condemn, you know, the General Assembly was voting on a resolution condemning the Russian annexation of the territories. Well, Putin certainly didn't help his case with that any. And the UN did, the General Assembly did, in fact, condemn the annexation. Uh, and NATO, you know, NATO's response is, all right, we're going to supply more air defense to Ukraine. 
They already had one set of one Iris German system in the in the pipeline that they've now deployed. But now it's like, all right, we're going to give them more, right? Now, little too little, you know, closing the barn door after the horse got out, maybe. But all they've done, you know, again, Russians attack Ukraine, Ukraine gets more support, right? The counter move is certainly there, though, and it will take some time. But again, the Russian volume is dri dribbled off, so it's maybe not as critical, right? So we've got that. Also, the European Union has looked at this, or the NATO, rather, has the European states have looked at it and said, hey, we don't have enough air defense. And this is something that's coming out, that in the Western side, there hasn't been as much air defense investment as some experts say they need. And they're... The Euro NATO is kind of saying, all right, we don't have a good thing, so we're going to launch the European Sky Shield Initiative. You know they're serious about it because they gave it a name. But the point, you know, I might joke about it, but I think the point is here we have another move by Putin, escalating the war, get a counter move locally, right, in the short term in, in Ukraine, but long term. You know, the Europeans are now committing to spend more to improve their defenses. Now, sure, it's going to take years for them to put something together. But when they do, it's probably going to be a lot more effective than what the Russians have got. And it's going to, you know, it's affecting the, the regional balance of power. And so it's, an, you know, kind of like when Finland and Sweden join NATO. Sure, you're keeping Ukraine out of NATO, but now Finland and Sweden have joined. And, you know, this is part of that, you know, the, the reaction, the backlash that I think in the long term is, is making this a huge strategic fail. Then the European Council. Now, the European Council is not the European Union. It's kind of a competing organization that the French were really pushing for. And their parliamentary committee, uh, the, uh, it, it's the, it might be the Council of Europe, actually. It's the PACE. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, right? I think that's the exact name of it. But anyway, these guys declared Russia a terrorist state. Big vote. You know, definitely the Europeans are registering their disapproval, right? We also have, by the way, in other news, uh, you know, we had the European Union foreign policy head, a bureaucrat, but, you know, he was saying, hey, talking about Russia, hey, if Russia uses a, a nuke, we will react. And, you know, it's basically saying we're going to intervene. You know, we're, it'll be conventional, but we'll destroy the Russian army. So, I mean, the you know, there's a lot of hawkishness in Europe. Now, we got to have an important caveat to all of this. The abstainers in the General Assembly, right? Uh, very few people voted with Russia, right? North Korea, Syria, Nicaragua. Belarus, right? These are the people that side with Russia on this. It's the abstainers that are important. China, China's abstaining, probably no surprise there. India was the one that, and as the week, early in the week, we were looking and, and, you know, I was looking at it and they were, they were, you know, they had statements about concern, right? Because they're very close with Russia. And, you know, they, it wasn't clear what they were going to do about the General Assembly votes. So there was, but they ended up abstaining. So there wasn't, in fact, movement on that front. That's an important front to watch. Also, in the Council of Europe, right, I should probably have it written out. Uh, it, it's a new organization. I'm still trying to get used to it. The point, though, is Turkey abstained from declaring Russia a terrorist state. Turkey maintain, is maintaining a bit of distance openness to, to dialogue with Russia. Uh, and, you know, they're the ones that brokered the grain deal and not for nothing, but Putin has been, he, this week he was signaling, oh, we could turn the gas on to Europe and Hey, we might make a gas hub in Turkey, you know, put some pipelines under the black sea, et cetera, et cetera. So whether he was trying to sow dissent in NATO or he's maybe trying to create a space for some dialogue without saying, you know, directly addressing it, not sure which, uh, that is at play. So that's an important caveat. But I think the big thing is what's happening with the target audience. His target audience are the mill bloggers, the nationalists, the pro-war faction. These are the folks that, 
as a result of the attack on the Kerch Strait Bridge were just outraged and starting to directly criticize him, right? And this is a problem for him, right? You know, he's getting all this criticism and they were, uh, you know, calling for uh, him to replace generals and they, they were saying, you know, complaining that he had not reacted to anything. And so they were actually starting to criticize Putin. So, you know, that was very straight. Now, there was some question as to whether they were already planning missile strikes ahead of time. I don't know. But certainly, I think these missile strikes uh, initially looked to be, you know, having success because the mill bloggers all came out, yes, this is what we want, this is what we need to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in the short run, for a few days, Putin got some good press. But by the end of the week, the mill bloggers have returned to criticism. There is detailed criticism of the mobilization, of putting troops. There's now reports of troops dying, unprepared, untrained troops dying in combat and you know, this is just continues to go on. So the criticism of the mobilization is going on. And the mill bloggers appear to be, you know, having a concerted effort that they're trying to criticize in order to improve it. Right. They want this to work. However, this is, you know, I think probably weakening the regime. They're also calling for Putin to replace certain generals, which a lot of people thought he might do as a result uh, of the Kerch. I was actually on Monday. He, he had a secretary or he had a Russian Council of State meeting, and I was wondering, was he, you know, what was going to happen at that? And it turned out it was just in, you know, him touting his missile attacks that had already occurred. So they they didn't do that, but now that they've returned to those calls, and so the factional fight is back on. It hasn't been avoided, and. Uh, ISW has a great line on this. First of all, they, they point out that, you know, the Kremlin keeps trying to message its way out of the problems it's having and it's not going to work. And But they've identified this thing, right, that they're arguing that, that the Kremlin is trapped in a cycle of, you know, it's a, trying to appease the pro-war crowd, the ultra-nationalist pro-war crowd, while keeping up Putin's vision of a limited war in Ukraine. And they're saying, look, these are incompatible, right? If you, you know, what these ultra-nationalists want is denazification, maximalist name. They want you to take all of Ukraine, right? And you aren't doing that. And in fact, if you're out s signaling that, oh, we can turn the gas on EU if you change your attitude. Uh, and, hey, Turkey, we could make you a, a, a hub if you're interested, you know. Uh, those kinds of overtures are a path to a compromise, which these folks will, will, will feel perhaps more of a betrayal than the, than the mill, than the, uh, the effed up mobilization there. I just said it. Okay. So this seems to be Putin's, you know, fundamental problem, right? Is he is and it's kind of like the missile attacks. You're doing missile attacks, but they're not affecting the war, right? I mean, in, at the tactical level here, at the strategic level, you're, you know, you're doing the missile attacks. It's temporarily distracting people, but it isn't addressing your fundamental problem that you are pursuing. A, you know, he's got two problems with this group that he's allowing to speak freely and have access. Right. And he's giving he's given kind of power to he's not, you know, to continue to screw stuff up right? because they are not that bad. And. His aims, even, you know, the, the, the ultimate goals, you know, they're screwing up the execution, but even the goals don't match. So this is a, a major problem. And so this is why I'm calling it missile fail, right? And I think in the end, his week of missiles uh, is just not getting him anywhere he needs to go and is creating backlash and in the long run uh, is, is probably hastening the Russian defeat. Thank you for watching my short rant. I hope it was short and not too much of a rant. I'm Dr. Dave Hayes, and though I teach at Troy University, this video is my own work. Troy University has neither approved nor reviewed the content. So there. And if you want to learn more about Troy anyway, figure out who would hire a guy like this, you can always go to www.troy.edu. 
I also am going to have a little card popping up here that you can go see my bio and some information about where I teach, which will descend to shameless self-promotion, but I want more students, what can I say? And finally, the music you've been listening to is Tonight at 8 by Shane Ivers. So thank you for listening, and I hope you'll come back and enjoy another short rant.